Welcome back to the Oscar Project Podcast, the show where I discuss Oscar-nominated films year by year. I'm your host, Jonathan Etreberg, and today I'm bringing you a recap of all the interviews I did in 2023. Between June and November of last year, I had the pleasure of speaking with 10 different authors about 11 books covering all aspects of the film industry. I even got to speak with several Academy Award winners about their student films. As you no doubt have noticed, I've already dropped a few new interviews here in 2024, so be sure to check out my conversations with Saul Austerlitz and Katie G. Salisbury if you haven't already. Please also be sure to subscribe to the show in your podcast player so you can get all the newest episodes as soon as they're released. If you like the show and want to hear more, please consider leaving a rating and review in Apple Podcasts or Spotify, and also be sure to check out The Oscar Project on Substack. And finally, I recorded most of the commentary for this episode in 2023, planning to release the episode back in December. So if you hear me talk about this year, I'm still speaking to you from 2023. My first guest way back in June was Mia Mask. I am extremely grateful to her for coming on as my first guest and graciously talking about her book, Black Rodeo, a history of the African-American Western. We talked about how her book tracks not only African-American inclusion in Westerns, but in the film industry as a whole. One of the things that should come across uh, in the book is that it's it's also tracking or, or giving us a kind of like parallel history of the film industry and of African-American mm-hmm. participation in an ability to be included in film production. So sure. I, I, right, so my book is primarily a book that begins from 1950, so it's a post-World War II study. Right. But if you go back a little bit further, if you go back to the 20s and 30s, there were African-American directors like Oscar Michaud, for example, who were making films that we might classify as some of the first African-American Westerns, films like The Homesteader, for example. Mm-hmm. But when you get to, once you get to the, the post-war era, right, we begin to, we're, we're still at a moment when African-Americans don't really have access to mainstream film making. That is, uh, it's, you know, really in the beginning of the civil rights movement, African-Americans are not given opportunities to direct um, and have very few opportunities to even star in Westerns at that right. juncture. So I was interested in looking at the evolution of that, right? Sure. The beginning of when we start to see African-American actors play a, a central role in these films, in Western films, and then how those roles evolved into African-American participation becoming even more significant. So we're seeing not only more characters, but we're beginning to see the stories being written by and directed by African-American directors uh, and and writers and uh, craftspeople working on the films. So the book is charting, you know, or trying to track that that um, that trajectory, if you will. And so that that may be some of the the shift or the, sh- the shifting that you're seeing. After speaking with Mia, I took a stab at having two guests on at once with Charlotte Booth and Brian Billington joining me to talk about their book, The Movie Lover's Guide to London. We talked about why they chose London for the subject of their book and why movie location scouts love London as well. Well, we, we started with London because obviously Charlotte knows London quite well. Sure. She knows all the, the small little back streets around London, and London's got such a, a you know a lovely uh, um, architectural history to it. And there's quite a lot of old buildings in London, so I quite enjoy walking around London, finding old buildings in tucked alleyways. And for the same reason, that's why um, location um, people um, do the same thing. So I think London is a draw for um, filmmakers as well for very much the same reason so it seemed like an obvious place to start rather than perhaps a a smaller um, English city where yes movies are made there but not in the abundance. Right you can get a lot of kind of older buildings in London and then you can find some brand new buildings that have just been built with modern architecture at the same time. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, so you have a ho- it sort of crosses all sorts of genres in movies as well because you can have science fiction with some of the super modern buildings where like right. the, um, the the metal work, the, uh, you know, like the lift work, Mission and Impossible and stuff. Yeah, and that's so, a lot of the new buildings around the Paddington area. Yeah, so you've got these buildings where the internals are all on the outside and look very space age. Mm-hmm. 
So you end up with this mixed genre of movies as well. Whereas if you go to somewhere like Wells, which um, we did the Hot Fuzz tour that we created around there, it's so old, you're only going to attract a certain type of movie maker there. Right, right, absolutely. Next up in July was my interview with Suzanne Ferris, where we discussed her book about the Sofia Coppola film, Lost in Translation. I asked Suzanne about what drew her to Coppola's work, and here was her answer. Well, I can tell you that it was her first film, The Virgin Suicides, and the reason why I went to the, the, see the film was because I was a big fan of the novel on which it was based by Jeffrey Eugenides. I just adored that book. And then when I saw the film, I thought she had not only done a beautiful adaptation, but I thought that I was seeing a visual aesthetic that really resonated with me um, and her use of very deliberate slow pacing some might say as well as really fantastic i thought use of music mm. and so those three elements i would say struck me from the start about her films and i've seen all of them and prior to writing recently about her i had also written with a friend mallory young about marie antoinette so i think that um, i have followed her journey since it started in 1999. When I reached out for more movie suggestions, I was not surprised that Suzanne included Coppola's newest film, Priscilla, in her top movies of the year. She also mentioned the stunning cinematography and great performances of Past Lives, which she mentioned in her interview, and gave special mention to Barbie. Her book recommendations echo The Sympathizer and Interior Chinatown from when we spoke, and she added the Copenhagen trilogy to the mix as well. Kristen Lopez was my next interview, and we discussed her book, But Have You Read the Book? I loved this book because it combined my love of reading and movies, something that Kristen shares, and we talked a bit about how the films and books included in her book were selected. Yeah, it was a collaborative effort with TCM. They had things that they definitely wanted to include, like Dune, which was their big movie when I was writing the book. So that was already kind of decided for me. And then from there, we, we both had stipulations that we wanted to make sure we were meeting which was like we wanted diversity of genre we wanted diversity of eras we wanted to make sure that women authors were included women directors were included uh, directors of color authors of color so we both had those elements that we wanted to make sure were in there and then it became kind of nitty gritty stuff you know is the book accessible can sure. people find it is it in print is the movie accessible is the movie popular is the book popular um you know, there were a lot of movies that i and books that i would have included that you know the movies either didn't make money or the books nobody really cared about so they they had to be a wide cross section there and then it just kind of became parsing you know small stuff like i had a lot of um murder mystery crime dramas in my first go round. they're like chris and you have like five Dennis Lehane novels, you know, you need to cut them. So, so yeah, once, once we kind of started going back and forth, it became pretty easy. And at a certain point, you know, people ask me all the time, did you pick 52? So you have one for every week of the year. And I, I wish I was that smart. Um, it just <laughs> kind of, just kind of became like yeah, 52. These books seem like I could do them all. Uh, so that's what we ended up with. Kristen is a great follow on Instagram, at KristenLopez88, all one word, as she always posts great videos and pictures of some of the exclusive events she's able to attend in Los Angeles, especially now that the strikes are over and people are out promoting their movies again. In the first of two interviews I did with Ian Nathan this year, we talked about his book, Clint Eastwood, The Iconic Filmmaker and His Work. I talked with Ian about how Eastwood can be considered a feminist filmmaker, despite often being thought of as one of the most macho actors on screen. Yeah, this seems like a, almost like a contradiction in terms, doesn't it? Because when you, you mention Clint Eastwood, you think of Dirty Harry, you think of all the Westerns, The Man With No Name, you think of a very male icon. Um, but if you think about him as a filmmaker, slightly aside from his, you know, his starring roles, you do come across a pattern, certainly in, um, well, throughout the career, really, but a lot, lot in the, kind of the first half of his filmmaking, where the female characters in his films are anything but ingenues, they're anything but sort of simpering love interests. They're very complicated, often quite dark characters. You go back to the very first film he directed, 
play Misty for me. And it's a story of uh, an obsessive woman who, who can obsesses on, on Eastwood's local DJ character. But she's drawn in vibrant, dark and complicated colours. You know, she is not a simple character. Right. And I think that that idea and that curiosity carries right across his films. Um, they may not be the biggest parts in his films, but I don't think he ever portrays women as simple. In The Gauntlet, an early action movie, um, he really has a, has a great female opposite him. And Sandra Locke, who obviously was in a lot of films with him at that time. But she is feisty and she is a rival. And in relation to the film, it was a cop movie uh, about a guy, uh, well, Eastwood's cop escorting Sandra Locke's hooker who's, who's seen too much of a crime. Mm -hmm. and they're out to get her. And he and she's she's the, the better half of the double act. She's the brains of the outfit. And right. that's so Eastwood, you know, of that time. When I asked Ian about his next project on that first episode, he mentioned another book about director David Lynch. When we sat down a second time, I pressed him to try and explain what the term Lynchian means when describing a Lynch film. <laughs> well, you happen upon the the, the kind of the central uh, sort of quest of the film of the book and the um, the thing I, I set out to do, and the hardest thing of all to describe, is what is Lynchian? You know, what is his work? Um, it's many things, um, and it's things that, also things I probably couldn't describe. I mean, it was, I think it was described by one critic, I use this quote, that it's impossible to put down in words, but you know it when you see it. Um, sure. There are elements of film noir, um, there are elements of horror, there are sort of elements of his his background in painting and surrealism, his desire to use dream logic as maybe the, the biggest brushstroke he has. There are there is a determination to set up riddles and puzzles for the for the viewer and not interpret them and not give an answer to them because he wants the viewer to have their own interpretations. His argument is that if he tells you what he thinks a razor head means or what blue velvet ultimately means or what Mulholland Drive works out to be, he would end the, the, the debate over his films. He would he'd bring a halt to what we think of or, or our own processes of interpretation. Because that's the most important thing in, in the Lynchian world. Is, it's not the answer, it's the questioning. It's our own journey within those films. Sure. And I think that's what ultimately Lynchian is. It's the unanswered questions. And of course, within that, there's wonderful things you can you can look at and test and decipher and conclude. And, and that's one of the joys. I mean, I say in my introduction that I'm not setting out to figure out David Lynch but you can't help but try because that's what the films do to you. And I think that's a true, the true nature of, of Lynchian is it's the unknowability of, of life, but it's asking the question all the same. Some of the most recent episodes I posted were my interviews with several of the winners of the Student Academy Awards back in October. Ian Forbes joined me to discuss his film Revisited that features a family dealing with the return of a father they thought had been dead for 20 years. I asked him what gave him the inspiration for the story. So I lost my dad when I was 13, so this kind of theme about grief, that's been something I've worked with a lot before. But what gave me this angle, that was actually a talk I had with my mum over a year before I started my final year at Norwegian Film School where she out of the blue I was home visiting and she said I had a dream about your dad last night. Uh, but uh, she'd met him at an airport and he'd said I've been alive for all these years. But before she managed to answer, ask him any questions, he, he walked off and uh, then she woke up and that just oh. gave me that kind of, the chills and I kind of started thinking, well, what would we do if he suddenly appeared? If, right. if someone you've missed yeah, for so long, it would be almost nightmarish, really, if they suddenly appeared outside your door again. So that's where the idea came from when we started developing then how this family stuck in grief, how this encounter and how that you know, gives them a lot of new perspectives. In the documentary category, I interviewed Giorgio Giotto about his film Wings of Dust. He told me the story of how he met Vidal Murma, the subject of his documentary. 
So it's a really particular story because I was hired as a DP for a job in South America and Vidal happened to be the person that we wrongly call the fixer. So he was, let's say, the local producer of this project. And one thing that I noticed and really caught my attention was how he was treated. Most of the time during the shooting, the people that were working with us were not being so respectful and he was just working for them sometimes, even being rude to him. And in those moments I realized how important it is to recognize and celebrate the value of his work. Because if you think about it at the end, we call him a fixer, but he's a journalist, the same way that the director of an important right. documentary it is. He's at my same level. The only difference that we have is different opportunities in terms of equipment, um, in terms also, you know, economical, coming from different backgrounds. So um, I believe that he's a journalist and he deserves his work to be celebrated in the in the best way. And I hope this, and I know that this academy opportunity is going to empower him so much. The final category at the Student Academy Awards was animation and I had the chance to sit down with four of the creators involved with making Boom. Take a listen as two of them, Charles DeSico and Roman Auger, discuss how the concept of the film evolved as they worked. And uh, there was a lot of uh, evolution in the, in the research when we did the movie, because, uh, for example, at the beginning, uh, we didn't have uh, birds, just eggs, and uh, like uh, we uh, didn't... Uh, we tried to uh, to do something of five minutes just with eggs, but we didn't succeed. So uh, we add uh, like two birds to add uh, more uh, dynamic action, etc. But uh, at the beginning, it was just uh, an egg and a volcano, as uh, Roman said. Yeah, the egg with the pose was the original idea, like an egg running anywhere it can and just. Uh, avoiding impacts and lava and uh, dangerous stuff, but he doesn't know it. That contrast in the situation was where we wanted to spark the comedy and the initial com uh, comic situation. And then it evolved a lot along the way. Two of the interviews I did earlier this year involved books that were more visually focused. The first was Karen Shadmi when we talked about his book Lugosi, The Rise and Fall of Hollywood's Dracula. We discussed Lugosi's relationship with the character of Dracula. Well, I think the the innovation of uh, Bram Stoker was that he showed Dracula as this like gentleman, as a charming, cultured society man uh, account that is kind of you know a very alluring and, and um, you know maybe even seductive character, um, and then. Uh, he, the monster is hidden and that makes him more human because, you know, with, with human beings, it's the same thing, the monstrosity or whatever is lurking in the underneath is, is usually hidden. It's, it's uh, you know, you don't know, some, someone could be very handsome and or, or very beautiful, a woman can be very beautiful, uh, and then they could have this awful personality underneath or they could be abusive or whatever. And I think that's what kind of connected with people uh, at the end of the day. A bit later this fall, I talked with Andrew DeGraff about his book, Cinemaps, which I've had on my shelf for quite some time. We started off the interview with him explaining what exactly a cinemap is. Yeah, uh, so uh, sort of the closest analog that I give people is, is sort of like a New York City subway map, which was kind of a visual inspiration point that it's almost a diagram of the movie. If you walked in from across the room, it would look nearly like an abstract painting um, with a sort of isometric feel, meaning a sort of fixed grid that you would be familiar with from like video games like SimCity or Zaxxon. As you move closer, you would realize that all of that information was actually drawing and that those drawings were part of a film probably that you've seen many, many times. And then there are kind of, so it basically charts every major scene in the movie, hopefully every scene, and then the characters move through the map um, diagram as, as kind of colored arrows. So there's no figures in the movies whatsoever. It's, it's really about the locations and kind of like 
the, the journey of all these like intersecting plot lines. Um, so the other analog that I give is like those old family circle cartoons of following Billy on his morning right, through his house. Right, so right. there's lots of little Easter eggs and points that you can find um, through them, but it's, it's pretty much a snapshot of, the, of an entire film. Andrew took a break from his latest film painting to give some recommendations. He told me that he revisited the 1989 film For All Mankind, not realizing how much he needed a bit of earnest optimism, which he said was immediately snatched away when he saw Talk To Me, released earlier this year. His book recommendation was The Three-Body Problem, the first in a series by Sixteen Lu. In the run-up to Halloween, I interviewed Brad Weissman about his book covering the history of the horror genre. I asked him about post-horror and where he thought the genre was headed in the future. I think the post, the quote-unquote post-horror uh, bubble is kind of popped, and I think that that has, has already like come and gone. We've seen a return to much more traditional types of horror movies in the past couple of years. Uh, I don't know where it's going in next. I think that um, one trend I noticed before that, before we got to that particular trend, was the idea that there are straight dramatic films with horror elements in them. Mm -hmm. and that uh, there's more depth and complexity of characterization, there's better plots, there's more elevated dialogue, but it's, it's a horror film. If you look at, um, at Get Out and The Shape of Water, two Oscar-winning films, you find one is a genuine horror film and the other, The Shape of Water, was so good that they couldn't call it a horror film, so they call it a fantasy film, which happens often. For his recommendations, Brad told me that he loved Megan, and he did the whole Barbenheimer thing, but suggested seeing Barbie first. He thought Killers of the Flower Moon was good and noted one movie that was good, but got totally buried, Rebecca Miller's romantic dramedy, She Came to Me, which stars Peter Dinklage, Anne Hathaway, and Marissa Tomei. For books, he mentioned the essays of Montaigne, which he brought up during our interview, and also enjoyed Four of the Three Musketeers, a performance biography of the Marx Brothers. Brad gave his Obscure Cinema Book of the Year award to Opening Wednesday at a Theater or Drive-In Near You by Charles Taylor, a celebration of trashy 70s cinema. Like Kristen Lopez's book about books and movies, Nate Patron's book The Needle and the Lens touched on the relationship between music and movies. And that's a pretty interesting question to start off with because I'm not really sure, and I'm not sure because it's the kind of topic I would think about for a long time, long before I ever considered even writing a book about it. I was a teenager in the 90s, and that was kind of a golden era for soundtracks as a way to discover music. Yeah. Like, I and a lot of other people my age saw Pulp Fiction, went out to get the soundtrack, and wound up with these glimpses into this world of music that you know, probably predated most of us, but still seemed kind of cool by association. You know, when you're talking like, you know, Cool in the Gang, or Dick Dale, or, you know, the likes of them. And I think that, uh, Martin Scorsese's Casino, and then Paul Thomas Anderson's Boogie Nights a couple years later were, you know, for me, the three films I remember having the most impact on my you know, teenage psyche as to this sort of symbiotic relationship between cinematic storytelling and the way it uses pop music to kind of accent or uh, kind of comment on the story itself. So it's, it's yeah, it's lingered in my brain for, uh, for a few decades now, yeah. Sure. And, and I thought it was interesting to that point, well, you note in the book that a lot of the films had the song informing the film, but then the film also gave the song a little bit of a resurgence, especially if it was you know a little bit of an older song that was being used. What is it about that interplay that works so well between these songs and the films that they're in? There's a lot of possibility there. And I think there's some deep impulse in a lot of people to try and connect the dots with you know, their own cultural tastes and interests. Like, oh, if I like this thing, I'll like this other thing. And then when someone like a filmmaker or, or you know, encourages this to happen in an unexpected or even just a really effectively memorable way, you can feel these connections kind of forming in real time as you experience it as a viewer and you get this sort of like little emotional buzz from the juxtaposition. You may go into a movie not knowing about a piece of music or the artist who made it, but if you click on a film's wavelength for a couple of acts, and then that film makes a very specific piece of music a part of this whole world, this mise-en-scene that you're immersed in, then yeah, it can feel like a revelation. Or if you're already familiar with the song, like I was with uh, 
on many of the selections in this book, you know, maybe even overly familiar, it can give you a new angle to approach it and appreciate it. And lastly, I had a great conversation with Nat Segaloff about his book, Say Hello to My Little Friend, A Century of Scarface. Since we just passed the 40th anniversary of the release of the 1983 Scarface, I asked Nat about why people love that film so much. Audiences like flamboyant characters, and I think the characterization of Tony Camonte by Paul Muni and Tony Montana by Al Pacino are those kind of characters. They also, you know, kind of go back to something, I think this is in John Milius' film Dillinger, where Dillinger, who was also over the top, says to the audience, in a sense, you do what I do if you had the guts. We identify with the Muni and the Pacino Tonys because we would really love to do that. In fact, that's why Al Pacino made the movie. He walked into, I think, the Tiffany Theater here in Hollywood on Sunset Boulevard and saw a revival of the 1932 Scarface, and he came out saying, I want to be Paul Muni. And that's what started the whole 1982 remake of Scarface in the process. And of course, if he wants to be Paul Muni in that movie, the only way he can do it legally is to do it in a movie like he did. <laughs> right. You really can't go around shooting people with alacrity. Nat was able to offer several films he's been watching recently for books he's working on, including Richard Brooks's The Professionals, the Murnau Flaherty film Taboo, and Weiler's The Good Fairy, written by Preston Sturgis. He recommends several books from Larry Grobel, including Conversations with Capote, Endangered Species, and Conversations with Brando. He was also about to dive into Gary K. Wolfe's original who censored Roger Rabbit, and he had received a copy of A Masterpiece in Disarray, David Lynch's Dune, and Oral History by Max Every. He also mentioned his book, More Fire, The Building of the Towering Inferno, that came out earlier this year, just in time for the 50th anniversary of that film in 2024. Thank you so much for listening to the 2023 recap of The Oscar Project. I will include links to all the books by these great authors in the show notes, and if you missed any of the episodes, make sure you're subscribed so you can go back and listen at any time. The Oscar Project Podcast is written and produced by me, Jonathan Etreberg, with editing assistance from Joshua Etreberg. There are plenty more great interviews coming in 2024, but until then, I hope to see you at the movies.